Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, which is the second in our four part winter webinar series. It's co-sponsored by the Kootenai Conservation Program, Columbia Basin Trust, with support from the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. Given the rich heritage of stewardship in the Columbia Basin, I would like to acknowledge that our work occurs in the traditional territories of the Tunaha, Shwepmek, Sinaixt, and Silks Okanagan people, who've lived here and cared for the land, water, and wildlife for many generations. KCP, along with the Trust and FWCP, are very excited to offer this series of webinars on the theme of building restoration and enhancement projects that make a difference. The purpose of this webinar series is to share valuable information on how to incorporate ecosystem resilience into your restoration projects with practical hands-on solutions through case study examples in the Columbia Basin. This series of webinars is designed to explore four key stages in the project development and implementation. These include visioning and planning a project, taking action, monitoring and analyzing, and adapting your approach and sharing your results and recommendations. My name is Marcy Marr and I'm KCP's Stewardship Manager and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Kendall Vanesh, KCP's Program Assistant, is also on board to ensure that our technology runs smoothly this morning. Kendall's cell phone number is in the chat box. If you need support, you can message her there. This webinar will be approximately 40 minutes with about 15 minutes for questions at the end. Please take a moment to locate your control panel at the bottom of your screen and please use the chat for messaging the group or individuals. And please use the Q&A box to type in your questions for the presenter. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation and this webinar will be recorded and made available on KCP's website. You'll also receive a follow-up email with a link to this webinar recording, along with the presenter's contact information and links to additional resources, as well as a short webinar series survey. So, so far we've got about 100 people on this webinar and we're always interested to know who's joined us. So please respond to these two questions in the chat. I know some of you got started on this when you first joined, but please add, where are you based and what is your affiliation? And I'll give you a couple of moments for that. Thank you. Wow, great to see so many people from so many places. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Great, looks like a great group today. And while some of you are still joining and settling in, I'd like to tell you a bit about the Kootenai Conservation Program, also known as KCP. We're a broad partnership founded in 2002, and this is our 20th anniversary year. And we'll be hosting a big celebration in, in September in Creston, and more details are provided in our e-news. KCP's partnership is comprised of over 80 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays in Southeastern BC. And our mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and to generate the support and resources needed to maintain this effort. I'd now like to invite Krista Watts from the Trust and Angus Glass from FWCP to also welcome you. Thanks, Marcy. Uh, my name is Krista Watts. I'm environment lead at the Trust. And an ecosystem enhancement remains a strategic priority for the Trust, which is one of the six strategic priorities, as well as the two integrated priorities of climate resilience and working with Indigenous peoples. These priorities stem from what Basin residents say are important. In addition to ecosystem enhancement being a strategic priority and climate resilience being an integrated priority, they're also trust programs. The ecosystem enhancement program supports landscape scale projects that help maintain and improve ecological health and native biodiversity in the basin. 
and the Climate Resilience Program supports large scale projects that help reduce the causes of climate change and takes action to manage those risks of climate change impacts. We've put the links in the chat to the web pages for both programs and recommend you check them out as there's program guides that walk through them in detail. The trust initiated and is assisting with the delivery of this four part webinar series to help build capacity around eco ecosystem resilient projects as a result of the feedback we received through the ecosystem enhancement program. We hope you find these presentations valuable and are able to incorporate your learnings into your ecological projects. And now I'll pass this over to Angus. Uh, thanks very much, Krista. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll be super brief. Uh, Angus Glass with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. That's a, a five-way partnership between BC Hydro, the province, DFO, First Nations and, and public stakeholders. And as a forward-looking organization, uh, we're really pleased to be supporting these sessions. Really encourage you to join us on LinkedIn and Instagram. Lynn's actually just popping those links into the chat right now. And of course, subscribe to our e-letters. We're actually hosting some great online sessions about FWCP funded projects, uh, starting off with BATS this Friday lunchtime, and then moving on to Endangered Marmots, Murphy Creek's spawning channel, salmon stewardship uh, with, in the face of climate change, but all of that, all of those uh, in the weeks ahead, the, those details are on our events page. So uh, thank you and back to you, Marcy. Great, thanks so much to you both. And we are always very grateful to the funders and supporters of the KCP program, including the Columbia Basin Trust and Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program, and without whom we couldn't do these types of programs. So before we get to our featured presenters today, I'd like to tell you uh, about our upcoming webinars. We have such an excellent and interesting group of speakers this year. So our webinars all occur on Wednesdays, and so next Wednesday at this time, uh, we'll hear from Julia Schwann and Dr. Suzanne Bailey on building climate resiliency into your aquatic restoration projects. And we'll have examples from the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area and the Columbia Valley. Then the week following, effectiveness monitoring for ecosystem restoration projects will occur on February 23rd, which is the closing of our four-part series. And Dr. Michael Miller will talk about why it's important and how to do effectiveness monitoring. And we'll have a case study from the Big Ranch in the Elk Valley presented by Mark Trudeau. Today, we have two presentations. The first one is Bees to Bears, Integrating Climate Adaptation and Restoration in the Kootenai River Valley. And you'll hear from Jesse Grossman, who's the US Program Manager of Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, and Casey McCormick from the Idaho Fishing Game, where he's the wildlife biodiversity biologist. And this project takes an innovative approach to climate adaptation. And they'll be talking about um, the climate refugia that they've created for six Northern Idaho species that are of greatest conservation need. And they'll also be exploring best practices and lessons learned in the planning, implementation, and follow-up for their project. And after Jesse and Casey, we'll hear from Sonia Serre, who's with Acom, and we'll hear about her project, Back to Baseline, Restoring Open Forests and Cultural Burning for Climate Resilience. And this five-year ecosystem enhancement uh, project aims not to just restore forests, but also natural processes and cultural practices in a fire adapted landscape. And Sonia will also share her experience supporting the implementation of this new and novel project. So I'd like to invite Jesse to please uh, share your screen and begin your presentation when you're ready. Thanks, Marcy. I'm just pulling my presentation up here. And hopefully folks can see it and hear me. And if not, someone let me know. Thanks. Okay, so I am Jesse Grossman, and I work for the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. 
And I just feel really grateful to be here and want to thank KCP and the Columbia Basin Trust and ACOM um, and everyone who's tuning in today. So I'm going to start out by sharing a little bit about Y2Y and then Casey McCormick with Idaho Fish and Game will talk a little bit uh, about Idaho Fish and Game and introduce that agency. And then we'll talk about how we develop this project together. So just quickly, a little bit about Y2Y. We work in the region from Yellowstone National Park to um, all the way up to the Yukon Territory. And this region overlaps with the territory of over 75 indigenous groups. And today I'm calling in from North Idaho in the Panhandle on the land of the Tanaha, Coeur d'Alene, Kalispell, and Nez Perce people. And our mission at Y2Y is to connect and protect habitat in this region so people and nature can thrive. And my work specifically focuses in a region called the Cabinet Purcell Mountain Corridor. And this is a really important transporter link for wildlife in the wider wide region. And you can see it um, where the red circle is on, on the bigger map. And so the location of the Bees to Bears project is in the Cabinet Purcell Mountain Corridor um, in the Idaho Panhandle, right below the US-Canada border. And it's connected to the Creston Valley and the Creston Wildlife Management Area. And it's part of a string of wetlands along the transboundary Kootenai River Valley. And we'll describe that in more detail in a little bit. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Casey McCormick with the Department of Fish and Game. Um, I just wanna also say thanks for the opportunity to present our work here as well. Um, I work in the Idaho Panhandle myself, I'm out of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, and as you probably can imagine, Idaho is a pretty small strip of land surrounded by Canada and two other states. And so um, I, I really value the opportunity to work with folks on the other side of either border um, and, uh, and really appreciate your time listening to us today. So um, anyway, as Jesse mentioned, um, we're working in the very northern part of the Idaho Panhandle. Um, basically, I just wanted to touch about how this, how this project ties in with Idaho Department of Fish and Games goals. Um, Basically, each state has a state wildlife action plan, and these essentially lay out the species of greatest conservation need that have been identified in each of those states. So Idaho has their own state, uh, or their, their own plan, I should say. And um, the, among those, we have the species listed. We also have conservation targets, such as habitat or other conservation goals and uh, management targets we want to try to meet with those. And with this plan, this is essentially where we can request funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to help manage these species or improve habitat or however we feel is the best way to go about um, helping these uh, SGCNs out, as we call them. So this project in particular, focused on six ACNs in northern Idaho, um, the western bumblebee, grizzly bear, pale jumping slug, northern leopard frogs, western toads, and please uh, cuckoo bumblebee. And they also focused on several uh, conservation targets we have uh, appointed in the, the plan. Um, that included forested lowlands, wetlands, um, cool air refugia, and a few others as well. So I just kind of want to show how our, our justification for starting this project and where IDFG is coming from with it. So go to the next slide if you want. Um, so as uh, Jesse mentioned earlier, um, uh, we have we both share an interest in the same area, of course, in Northern Idaho. And we've had some previous uh, interactions and collaboration with uh, Y2Y and Idaho, Idaho Department of Fish and Game before. I mean, so when this project came up, it seemed like a great opportunity to work together and further collaborate and for both of our organizations to, um, to really hopefully pull off a useful project and, um, and both achieve our goals at the same time, so. Um, and as I alluded to earlier briefly, um, a large part of the funding for this project had come from uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service with competitive state wildlife grants. But those grants um, also need require a significant amount of match as well. So a huge portion of our funding also came from um, very generous donors, um, Y2Y, Wildlife Conservation Society, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and many others. So I just wanna say thanks to all those uh, that helped make this happen. Um, and then to touch a little bit uh, more specifically on the exact area where the project has occurred. Um, essentially, we have one um, 
WMA right at the Canadian border, um, just south of Creston there in the Kootenai River Valley called the Boundary Smith Creek Wildlife Management Area. It's about 2,000 acres in size, um, and it was established in 1999 where uh, IDFG got ownership of the land. Before that, it was agricultural land, um, much like the rest of the valley south of that. Um, and so this, this ended up being a great WMA to, to start this project on for many reasons. First off being that it was already within um, IDFG ownership and management. So it made kind of getting on the ground work um, a little bit more efficient and easy to do. Um, but it also was identified as a really great um, lowland connectivity habitat for Y to Y as like um, one of the few places in the valley that wildlife can maybe move back and forth um, and have lowland habitat that's not just forested mountain area. Um, in addition to that, um, in a previous study by the IDFG called the Multi-Species Baseline Initiative, this area was identified as having a lower mean annual air temperature than other parts of the panhandle. And so it seemed like a really logical place to try some of these um, experiments like the cool air refugee we'll talk about later. Next slide. Thanks, Casey. Yep. So as Casey mentioned, there are lots of great reasons to look at doing this project at the Boundary Smith Creek Wildlife Management Area. And when we were developing the project plans, we wanted to both look backward at historical conditions while also looking forward and considering climate change. So we have this reference photo on the left that I believe IDSG had um, that shows the Kootenai River Valley around 1916 before the Libby Dam was built upstream. And in working to understand the historic conditions of the site, in addition to this photo, we also had the opportunity to interview a council member from the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho about some of the historic conditions. And one of the things that he described was this really dynamic ecosystem that was changing through the seasons, especially when it came to water. And just the seasonal shift of um, ephemeral habitat that was really the basis for um, our original project planning. And there was and still is an incredible amount of biodiversity here. And the area has largely transformed from this uh, dynamic changing lowland forest to primarily agricultural land, which you can see in the other photo here with a much more static hydrology. Um, and this kind of ties into another part of the project. Um, we have a hydrological modification part of the project that was kind of based with another separate competitive state wildlife grant um, that was focused on northern leopard frog recovery. Um, and this also included um, Idaho, uh, Washington, and British Columbia had many different aspects to it, but one of the large aspects to it were, was kind of based around bullfrog control and creating um, better habitat for native amphibians, including northern leopard frogs. And so um, a, a portion of, of the project we did here was funded by this, and it was to try to help or um, reduce the number of um, bullfrogs in the area and try to reduce their expansion. So they've been unfortunately expanding and for moving further north in Idaho and now are in British Columbia, as many of you probably know. Um, and so th this project or the separate grant helped fund some bullfrog control, including removal in Canada and on the Boundary Smith Creek Wildlife Management Area. But it was also there, it was primarily there to protect the northern leopard frog population that's up at the Crescent Valley um, Wildlife Management Area in British Columbia. So um, all of this is to say that um, part of what we're doing here is to hopefully reduce um, bullfrogs in Idaho with the work we're doing here to hopefully help protect the northern leopard frog population in British Columbia and prevent further bullfrog expansion north, at least the best we can. So I just wanted to touch on that and its importance and kind of the transboundary trans conservation goals we had. Um, Another part of the project that we'll touch on a little bit more later are cool air refugia designs to try to create those cool air refugia areas we referred to earlier or goals we referred to earlier. Um, these were basically to retain cooler air and more moisture. Um, you can kind of see the designs here. There's three different types. Um, they, we have a curvilinear and a linear and a hummock. 
and those were kind of just to try different designs out to see if any worked better than others. Um, they kind of run the ridges that you might see in the photos here, or at least in the diagrams here, run east to south, um, or not east to south, east to west. Um, and you can kind of see a completed photo here where essentially um, they help block sun coming from the south, the idea of creating shade and hopefully reducing temperatures and retaining moisture. They were designed by um, Brian Heck with Ducks Unlimited. Um, and the whole idea with creating these cooler areas is to hopefully benefit the SUCNs I mentioned earlier, um, and also hopefully retain um, more of the native species we want to benefit those SGNs, SGCNs, so like wildflowers for the native bumblebees that we want to benefit from this project. So I mean, these are photos that are just kind of help you envision the size. They're each about a hectare in size, or half hectare in size, and about 10 to 15 meters between the ridges and about one and a half meters high, depending on the, on the deal, but just to kind of help you envision what they look like. Next slide. So additionally, we, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to restore some of that lowland forest and shrub vegetation that we saw in the reference photo to both increase shade, to cool air temperatures and hold water and the project site. And also uh, one of our other goals was to increase and promote pollinator habitat. And so we used this part of the project as an opportunity to engage the community and engage volunteers. We were able to work with over 250 volunteers to do a whole range of activities from helping us plant uh, the 50,000 trees, trees and shrubs in the project area, identifying bumblebees and other pollinators and collecting and planting local seeds. So just to touch a little bit on the, the hydrological projects that we were actually able to accomplish is we were able to build about 1.2 kilometers of ephemeral stream bed that was um, kind of like a historic stream bed that had been changed with the agricultural transformation. Um, and we also constructed four ephemeral ponds. Um, and just to touch a little bit about the idea of the ephemeral side of things, if, um, if folks aren't aware, bullfrogs typically take two seasons to, um, to be uh, uh, for successful reproduction. And so if you have ephemeral ponds then that hold water fairly late into the summer, hopefully what you have there is an ideal ponds that all native amphibians in the area can benefit from and breed in and, um, and move from after, after they uh, get to that stage in their life cycle while bullfrogs won't be able to use that habitat for breeding as the pond will hopefully dry up by the end of the year. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get here is try to find that, that perfect balance to get an actual ephemeral um, wetland created. Um, so yeah, th that was also helped with Ducks Unlimited. Um, and uh, we, after we've completed this, we did learn some lessons. So challenges have arisen. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the ephemeral stream bed itself seems to be working pretty well, but the ponds that we created do not seem to be holding water. And um, we think we know that for a few different reasons now. We know they might need to be deeper to get a little bit closer to the water table down below and help keep a little bit more moisture in there for longer into the season. Um, I think we know now that we would have benefited from more than one or two seasons of monitoring in that area to see like how much moisture ends up in the area and um, and how quickly it dries up. So we know now it would have been helpful to have a little bit more time to plan. Um, we also know that it's possible there could be soil layers within those ponds that are draining them like a sand layer. It sounds like that's happened in other parts of the Creston Valley. Um, and so it would have been great to be able to adapt and change the project on the fly as we are digging those ponds rather than just digging them and assuming they're done. Um, I'm not totally sure if that's what's going on, but it would have been great to have that ability to adapt to that. Um, and we also know now that it'd been great to maybe plan for things to not go quite as well, um, to maybe plan a little bit more monitoring and maybe funding for modifications after the initial project was complete. So maybe not to assume that the project was done with the initial construction, but planned a few years into ahead. ahead. Um, so moving on to the cars, we were able to construct 13 cars. Um, there were three linear cars, four curved cars, three hummocks and three controls created. The controls were just flat areas to uh, basically compare how um, effective the cars were. Go on to the next slide. Um, and so we were able to determine whether these structures were actually effective with some in-depth um, 
climate monitor microclimate monitoring over the first few uh, the first season of, after they were built we did see that the mean temperature mean high temperatures on the north facing slopes and troughs were about one and a half c to four and a half c's um, lower than that of the con flat control areas they also with just some modeling um, seem to experience about eight to eleven percent less ro radiation than the um, than the flat control areas as well um, and they did seem to retain more moisture as well, at least on the north facing slopes and in the troughs. The one important thing we did learn from this is that some of our, um, some of our uh, cars were kind of built into the ground. They're essentially built in place with the dirt that was existing there. So trenches were built and the mounds were built with the, the dirt from those trenches and other ones were built on the existing soil surface from the ponds. And those that were built on top that were further away from the water table were much drier, much warmer, and also did not hold nearly as much moisture as you might expect, as you as you would probably expect. So we've realized that those that were dug into the ground are much more effective and seem to be growing the plant species we actually want them to grow and have fewer weeds. Um, but we still have a lot to learn and we plan on doing continued monitoring and wildlife monitoring to see if they're being used into the future. Um, as far as the planting accomplishments go, we were able to plant um, native vegetation on over 100 acres um, and do invasive plant, re plant removal on those 100 acres. And we were also over, um, able to plant over 50,000 trees and shrubs. Um, a lot of this came from help from the volunteers that Jesse mentioned earlier. Um, and hopefully the goal here is to get it closer to that forested lowland habitat that we um, that we we're the valley used to have um, and be beneficial to the connectivity for um, for habitat use um, for species like grizzly bears and other other species. So. so as you've probably heard by now, we tried a lot of things and we had some successes and we have some ongoing challenges. And so we really want to talk about some of the challenges and the lessons learned about this project because something that we've found is that there's really a gap in the literature and sharing about certain types of restoration projects and how well they work. Um, and then also thinking about trying new things with climate adaptation, how important it is to report back and share these learnings as climate adaptation becomes more and more of um, something that people are incorporating into restoration. And so sharing some of our, our learnings and lessons is one of our goals moving forward with this project. So just to start out, our biggest challenge currently is definitely weeds. And we're finding that the weeds at the project site really need intensive control and replanting. And while this is really common with any disturbed area, there are some things that we could have done on the front end around site preparation um, and treatments and things like that, that could have made it a lot easier um, on us now. Specifically, reed canary grass and Canada thistle are two species that uh, are especially challenging currently. And there were also some factors that were out of our control that really um, factored into the weeds really thriving and some of the native vegetation having a little bit more of a challenge succeeding. And that was these historic hot and dry conditions that we've had over the last couple of years, um, the drought conditions, and then just the historically hot summer that, that we had um, this past year, especially. So one thing we've really been thinking about is how this is climate change impacting our climate adaptation project in real time. And it's definitely something to consider as you develop of your project. And then just to continue on with some of the challenges and things that we learned, three kind of themes that came up for us were around timing, funding, and monitoring and modification to the project. So the one, I think, big lesson is that the project will most likely take much longer and be a lot more expensive than you will plan for. And so really building out a generous timeline and including both time and money to address the unforeseen challenges that will come up is really important. Funding as well, we found that um, a lot of funding timelines, both in the agency and the nonprofit areas 
are often constrained to, to short one to two year time periods where you're expected to deliver within, within that time frame. And we gave ourselves two years to design and implement this project. And ultimately it ended up feeling fairly rushed. And I think three years minimum would have been really helpful, but looking back, I think thinking on that five to 10 year minimum scale just for planning and project development and follow-up would have been um, what I would do next time. And then the last thing I wanted to just talk about is monitoring and modifications and just the importance of building that into your plan from the beginning. That's something that, as you've heard, we're working with now um, in terms of getting this project to the, the place where we, uh, where we want it to be, to be functioning, to meet the original goals. But that requires for us finding additional funding and developing additional plans that um, again, I think could, could have really benefited from building that in on the front end. Um, so as you might expect uh, from what we talked about, some of our next steps and long-term goals right now, we're reallocating a lot of our funds to weed control first off to try to get ahead of that. Um, before we move on to other parts of the project we were hoping to. Um, and then we'll request additional funding to replant those areas, hopefully in the future and continued monitoring. Um, the hydro um, features like the ponds that aren't holding water, those will be a little bit bigger project to, to rebuild. Um, and so that's something that we can uh, kind of wait to, to work on, but hopefully in the future, we'll be able to invest the time needed to get those the way we, we want them to be and hopefully create the habitat we want them to. Um, and then, uh, long term, we really want to like make sure we continue to monitor and share what we've learned. And so um, we know, as Jesse kind of touched on, and we thankfully have kind of already got ahead of this, but um, we plan on monitoring well into the future. It'll probably be five or 10 years, I'd imagine, before we really know how successful this project is and we really start getting the species we want to be growing there and hopefully start seeing this, the wildlife species we hope to utilize that show up there. Um, and so, yep, we're hoping on continuing new climate monitoring well into the future and also doing, um, you know, veg monitoring and, um, looking at uh, you know, wildlife surveying, like pollinator surveys, for instance, to, to see if those species are showing up like we'd hoped. Um, and that's our plan as of right now. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to our presentation. I hope that this helped you. And we wanna end by just thanking a few people quickly, Michael Lucid and Lacey Robinson, Brian Heck and Chris Bone Sr. with Trout Unlimited, all of the volunteers that participated in the project, the Xerxes Society, Idaho Conservation League, our funders, the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho, uh, Yakanuki, and everyone else involved. And so please reach out to Casey or me. We would be happy to connect with you about this. And thank you again. Great. Thank you so much, um, Jesse and Casey. Awesome information. Um, so as Sonia is setting up, I just want to remind folks that we're going to do these two presentations back to back. If you have questions for Jesse and Casey, please identify it in the Q&A uh, box so uh, we can keep track of what um, is appropriate for Jesse and Casey to answer and um, what's appropriate for Sonia. So as she's setting up, um, you can share screen when you're ready there, Sonia. Hey. Great. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking to a very different ecosystem than Casey and Jesse, but I think I, there's a lot of themes that are really similar in, in our lessons learned <laughs> specifically. So um, I, yeah, I think, I think this will be very valuable to everybody. Okay. All right, make sure that my slides are working here. Okay, so Kisa Kwitnam, everybody. Kukaksik Sanya Sayer, my name is Sanya Sayer. I am a settler living and working in Tunaha territory in the Kimberly Cranbrook area. And I work for the community of Akam. Uh, my background is actually, um, I noticed there was someone from Saanich here, that's where I grew up. Uh, but my family is also settlers hailing from Sokotin, Sequatmik, and Dakal territory in the Caribou Central Interior. So, um, I included this picture. This is this is a picture of me uh, in our community garden, which is also a project I manage. And I just wanted to 
share a bit of Tanakh philosophy with everybody. Um, so in, in Tanakh culture, there really are no experts uh, and everyone is a knowledge holder and that includes young people as well. Uh, and I originally included this picture in the garden just to share uh, my, my Jill of all trades, master of none, <laughs> um, life, life philosophy, but also um, I think gardening is a really good example of a uh, lifelong practice of making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. So it's very applicable to these projects as well. Uh, for a little landscape context, uh, so Occam is actually five uh, total land, par land parcels in total in the Cranbrook area. Um, our project location is uh, the Kootenai Indian Reserve number one, which is the at the confluence of the same areas in Kootenai rivers. And this is our primary residential community, uh, as well as the primary area of cultural practice for our community too. Um, I did wanna share a little, a couple words on, on the history of cultural burning because it's very relevant to our project. This picture is actually not taken at Akam, but this uh, is from an area that's close to my heart in the Caribou and Chilcotin. This is the Net Unisitin tribe that has, has taken back cultural burning and is incorporating that practice. Um, so the ecosystems that we work with here in, in the Cranbrook area in the Rocky Mountain Trench are uh, ponderosa pine and dug fir leading and are understood as fire maintained ecosystems, which means they naturally saw frequent stand maintaining fires and rarely stand initiating fires. So Chinaka people like many indigenous communities use fire as a stewardship tool. And that was to enhance large tracts of land, grassland, as well as open forests to improve forage for ungulates and then livestock to influence movement of elk herds. And in some cases, even to practice cultivation as with tobacco plains. And this practice was actually outlawed around the time of reserve creation. Um, I am going to get Kendall to share a few links if you are interested more in the history of cultural burning and its um, sort of renewed practice in areas of British Columbia. Um, it's a little bit off topic, but I know there might be some interest, so I'll get her to share those links and you can look them up if you are so interested. Okay, so I really wanted to share, I think, as, as Casey and Jesse showed, they had some photographs that really illustrated the change in the landscape. And I've found that in my practice, air photos have been so essential at doing that. Um, so Akam, the, the word Akam in Tanakhad actually means dense forest, um, which is probably not understood by many. Um, but what does dense mean? So I said we all, that culture burning was all, uh, outlawed in the late 1800s. That was around the time of reserve creation. And then we also have been suppressing fire in our region for almost a hundred years. We did not replace those natural or man-made disturbances with other stewardship practice. So this is an, this is an air photo taken uh, in 1952. And then this, this air photo, or sorry, this is LIDAR uh, ortho imagery that was captured in 2018. So I just wanna point out a few things on these photos to try and get, illustrate the differences. Um, so you can see the blue square here, comparing this sort of unique, uh, this unique draw, this, this landform in the 50s and 2010s. Um, you can see the ingress of the forest here, the, dense, the density of the forest in, in the later photo. And the other issue, of course, is grassland encroachment. So I'm highlighting a grassland section of our project area here. Um, so you can see how much that forest has encroached upon um, on, on the grassland there. Uh, so this is a picture of our project area. I am realizing I did not show you. So I'm gonna zip back a few slides just to show you where that is. So the light, the light pink, uh, outline there is the, is the area where our ecosystem enhancement project is currently taking place. Okay, so um, this is also a photo that was taken in the project area by Ian Adams. Um, this gives you a sense of how dense this forest has become just due to the lack of light. 
Um, at the beginning of our project, we really wanted to address or highlight the values and uses, um, different habitat values for these lands. So those that for our community meant cultural and habitat values. So includes food and medicine plant harvest, uh, subsistence hunting takes place on these lands as well, firewood gathering, recreation, and there are also sacred places that we wanted to protect in our project design. And then we also had a sort of hit list of, of species at risk as well that were associated with these areas. Um, little buddy here are a common, is a common nighthawk. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other birds, bats, badgers, uh, as well as ungulate species of interest to our community for foods. Okay, the goal of our project. Uh, this is the written goal. It's very, it's very verbose. So I'm going to try and break it out for everybody. So to enhance, uh, the goal was to enhance ecosystem resiliency and function through space and time at the stand and landscape levels for the defined project area and the connecting landscape. Um, so first to speak to ecosystem resiliency, I, uh, I pulled this definition from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, so it's the ability of an ecosystem to maintain its normal patterns of nutrient cycling and biomass production after being subjected to damage caused by an ecological disturbance. Uh, what does that mean through time? In our case, it means undoing 100 years of ingress due to fire suppression, uh, returning to a healthy baseline to reset uh, for cultural burning practices that will hopefully take place in the future, and to balance returning to pre-contact conditions and adapting to current climate conditions. And what does that mean over space? <laughs> so uh, that means uh, at the stand level, prescriptions that work with the assets of each stand, and then at the project area level, blocks that create a patchwork of habitat types and values. And then at the landscape level, a project area that contributes to a connected landscape. So you can see our, our project area and the different treatment types, which I'll break out in more detail. And then also we've got uh, the Kootenai IR1 parcel in relation to other ecosystem restoration and habitat projects in the, in the Kootenai Trench here. Okay, so how did climate factor into our project planning? Um, what we really planned for at the very beginning was were two, two pieces of reduction in wildfire risk and severity. And I'm gonna show you why that's so significant to our community. So this, this is a photo from Google Earth of the residential area on, on Occam lands. So you can see the network of roads. Um, you may be able to make out a few of the houses as well. Um, and if you haven't been able to tell from the smudge on the screen, the orange uh, outlined area is actually a, um, the extent of a wildfire that ripped through our community in 2017. So it has hit very close to home very recently. Um, so what we aim to do with uh, wildfire risk reduction um, is to reduce the fuels, um, so standing trees and the forest floor fuels to mitigate risk and fire activity as well because it can influence how severe a fire has becomes and also to increase the decid deciduous shrub and perennial grass components uh, which are less volatile. And then of course ecosystem resiliency as I said before was a target um, which is the ability to bounce back from disturbance. But then as we, as we sort of moved through the project, there was also things that became apparent to us that we also achieved. So um, one of those things is, is groundwater conservation and drought tolerance. We're removing a lot of uh, or water demand in <laughs> removing overstory trees. Um, we're also uh, seeing a lot of water over over time be lost on an arid landscape. So this will help us um, conserve the water for the uses that our ecosystem needs and our, and our, and our people need. Um, we, in targeting unique species for retention, have created a diverse and adaptive seed bank. So as the climate shifts, we have a, a diversity of species that can, can offer seeds to a adapting climate, uh, adapting ecosystem, adapting stand. We've protected connectivity and cool microclimates. 
And we've actually contributed to the economic sustainability of our community as well, because um, currently there isn't much timber value in the forest as it stands. Um, and as we sort of, uh, as we steward that, as we thin forest, um, we're expecting that we're gonna get bigger trees and potentially those can be utilized by our community in the future. Okay, uh, so how do we restore a fire maintaining ecosystem? In our case, first we thin, and then we burn. Uh, this is actually a photo of a 2018 prescribed burn that took, took place on Occam lands. And a few words on project design. So uh, this is our ecosystem enhancement area. It's 1300 hectares in total. The red areas are areas we employed mechanical harvest. So logging with machines, uh, that's totally uh, in total 275 hectares and our retention targets are 150 to 200 stems per hectare of, of larger trees, typically. Um, and those treatments are come, come around $2,000 a hectare to treat. And then these yellow areas that you can see are our hand brushing areas, which is a technique that we're much more familiar with through interface work. Um, and that's about 135 hectares. Uh, brushing includes pruning, falling small trees, uh, pile burning all by hand. And then those retention heart targets are 100 species per hectare more than, the, more than the mechanical harvest, so 250 to 350 stems per hectare. Uh, but they are more costly at, at about $5,000 a hectare per treatment. Um, and that varies depending on what the ground is like. Um, so unlike other ecosystem restoration work we've done, we left a matrix of different habitat types this time. And our leave area was actually 890 hectares. So that includes riparian areas, corridors for travel, critical habitat features, so nest trees and wild up tree patches, uh, sensitive sites and archeological features, which is 68% of our project area in total. Uh, and I'm worried about the little blue, uh, sorry, the, the purplish shaded areas. Those are our machine free, free zones that we established. Um, based on sensitivity or proximity to archeological sites. And I just wanted to share because I think it's it's taken for granted that we're in a we're not in a in a perfectly flat landscape. Um, this is the this is the lidar hillshade. Um, so it shows some of the glacial scarification and it shows a lot of those microclimates that we've used um, for for corridors here. So that was project design and project execution and operations re required a lot of red tape. Um, so we needed a lot of money, <laughs> more than we originally thought, as, as Jesse has, has alluded to. Uh, we needed a permit from our own administration in accordance with land code. Land code means that we are a self-governed Indigenous community, so we make the decisions on how we manage our lands, but we do need approval at the leadership level. We needed a permit from the Canadian Wildlife, Wildlife Service, IA Species at Risk permit. We needed baseline data, including a Species at Risk inventory, invasive plant inventory, archaeological overview assessment, and we needed to establish in, uh, sorry, effectiveness monitoring plots. We needed a burn boss and a burn plan um, because of the nature of the burn. We needed support from our neighbors, the city of Cranbrook, uh, the Rocky Mountain Trench Natural Resources Society, and the airport authority, because we are adjacent to the Canadian Rockies International Airport. And we need support from the BC Wildlife Wildfire Service. Uh, we will be acquiring a burn number when we get to that place, but um, it is something that we need to, a, a uh, protocol we need to follow. Okay, so I, I really wanted to focus um, because brushing is not necessarily something that's new. The hand brushing uh, methods that we employ have been used by Occam and other partners for a long time, um, but we recognized to cover as much ground as we needed to. We really needed to uh, focus on cost recovery for some of that. And so we employed mechanical harvest, um, but we knew we wanted higher retention and we wanted less disturbance than, than commercial harvest or traditional harvest. We did have some things on our side. 
We had experience doing ecosystem restoration before for a forested site. Um, so we had the lessons learned that we could take into this project. We have an in-house forester, uh, John Brace, uh, a registered professional forester who I, study, who I now study under as a forester in training. Uh, we had timber cruise data for that entire area, which made the development of prescriptions much quicker. Uh, most of the area was eroded, and we also had good relationships through our um, salvage project that we did on the wildfire site with a contractor who was open to new approaches and experienced in finding niche markets. So this is a picture of a recently harvested area. This is a mechanically harvested area um, in January of 2021, so about a year ago now. So to log differently, <laughs> we know we needed to log on frozen and snow covered ground. Um, that's a pretty, pretty much across the board believed to be the right practice for the Rocky Mountain Trench now. It was harder to do than expected. Uh, with recent winters, we've had warming temperatures, we've had melt, melt and, and thaw cycles, and we've had a fairly low snowpack. So it wasn't a perfect system. We also left trees in clumps, um, as you can see in this picture, um, and that increased our retention numbers and it also minimized the ground disturbance. And we also prioritized unique species in that. Um, we do have some areas that capture some larch as well as deciduous trees. And we protected all very high and high value wildlife trees, which was not insignificant because there were hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, and a word on, on marketing our wood. So in terms of the, that cost recovery, I just wanna sort of share what, um, what markets our forester and, and loggers were able to find. So our ponderosa pine saw logs went to uh, mill in Montana and they uh, were either made into highway rails or medium density fiberboard. Uh, our Doug fir saw logs went to the Canfor mill Elko and there was quite a bit of pulp that also came from the project. That all went to paper excellence at Scoop and Chuck. The wood waste, so our slash, um, was or, or will be, uh, so part, part of it has been completed and part will be in the future. Uh, so all of our wood waste was ground for hog fuel to feed the cogen plant at Skookum Chuck. And this was a no cost agreement with paper excellence. So um, they did not charge us for the service and we did not charge them for the materials, uh, but that utilized a lot of our wood waste and reduced a lot of that emissions from, from slash burning. So following that, this is not the same block, but this is a mechanically harvested stand the spring after harvest. So this was last June. Um, what you can see here is uh, all of the all of the leafy veg <laughs> that's that's on the forest floor there. That is actually an early balsam root coming up. All right, next steps uh, for us uh, is is preparing for prescribed burning. Um, hopefully in April of next year. This is a picture of our knowledge holder, Marty Williams, illustrating the pine straw and litter accumulation that we're seeing because of uh, that fire suppression. So to get Occam to a place where cultural burning can safely take place again, we have to complete a prescribed burn with many, many controls. Uh, so we need a burn boss and a burn plan. We need crews, machines, and air support. We need extensive guards. We have to do sort of a, it is going to result in a, a bit of a higher intensity fire because of the fuel loading. So after that, then the hope is to complete more routine, small, low intensity burns coordinated by community fire keepers, but that will likely have to see some regulatory changes before we can execute those. So my takeaways, my, my, my TLDR, too long didn't read, uh, just a few sort of hot points for everybody to remember. Um, many of these closely correlate with Casey and Jesse's as well. Don't underestimate the expense of your project. So uh, estimate, estimates now, uh, we're still not at the end of the project. We're at year four out of five, um, but we're estimating 1.8 million dollars or more uh, total cost for those five years. 
Um, our activities are expensive in nature. So hand brushing is expensive, equipment and errors for it and crews for prescribed burning is expensive. And what we learned is that cost recovery from our logging was limited. Um, so we were able to take uh, in, in the form of pulp and saw log about 70 to 90 cubic meters per hectare, but only 17% of that was saw log, the rest of that was pulp. And there was quite a bit of wood waste. Uh, plan for plan for long term storage trip. That means that the design phase and and just post project your investment post project. Um, try and mitigate any stewardship concerns that you have when you are working on project design. So for us, I'm going to use the example of invasive plants um, from our previous ecosystem restoration work. We knew we had to increase canopy closure, uh, so greater than 25% uh, in our case is is what we aimed for for each of these sites even the lowest retention areas. We knew we had wanted to complete logging in the winter, so that decreased ground disturbance. And we actually conducted uh, herbicide treatments in every project year on, on roads, uh, any, any sort of vectors um, with approval from our Occam, Nisukan and Council. And even still, our organization is gonna have to manage invasive plants beyond the project's uh, five-year timeline. Uh, three, to understand how a change in climate will impact your operations. Um, so for us, that included harvest and burning windows. Um, we had originally planned to complete harvest over one season. And just because of the um, lack of frozen ground or the, the warmer temperatures, we've had to complete it over two. Um, and in terms of burning windows, we experienced last year, um, we didn't conduct any prescribed burning, uh, but we had incidental wildfires. Uh, we had four that took place in late April. So that's really shortened our window of safe burning um, because typically burns take place in April. So we're really looking now at early April burning. And finally, I just uh, <laughs> used, the, used the term know your worth. Just um, it's, it's really valuable to have a good uh, fluency in climate language and the ability to identify the multiple of climate impacts and benefits will serve in identifying and securing resources and in telling your story. So in our case, we were able to secure funding from many different avenues from, from ecosystem enhancement to, to climate funding to infrastructure funding um, because we were protecting our community from severe wildfire. So really know how, all the ways that your project is contributing to climate adaptation. And I just wanted to thank at the end of my presentation here, uh, all of the supporters of our project. So to our financial supporters, including the Trust, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada through the Canada Nature Fund, uh, FNES, the Community, Community Resiliency Investment Fund, which is through UBCM and the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. And this is a photo also of our knowledge holder, Maury Williams, our forester, John Brace, and Ms. Yuk and Joe Pierre on the project site. Tachas. Thanks very much, Sonia. And I want to let everybody know we're, we're at the top of the hour here. And so if you need to leave, uh, the contact information for our presenters will be in our follow-up email to you if you have a question that uh, you, we didn't get to answer while you've been on this uh, webinar. And we'll also be following up with the recording uh, a link to the recording. I would like to also just ask folks if you can stay on for another 10 minutes or so, we will have uh, our, our question and answer period. And before we do that, I just want to pass the baton to Krista Watts, who had has some information that she'd like to share, um, a climate resource that the Trust has developed in partnership with Silkert College, a Columbia Basin climate source. Thanks, Thanks Marcy. Uh, yeah, so I want to introduce the Columbia Basin Climate Source. It's a one-stop source for climate data, impacts, and actions for the basin and boundary regions. When you land on the web page, you have the option of taking a tour, going straight to the data, or you can visit one of these tabs uh, or visit these tabs on the top. First one's communities. Here you'll get a two-page downloadable climate summary for every community and band in the region by just clicking on the icon. 
impacts, you can drill down into climate challenges and opportunities for economy, infrastructure, nature, and quality of life. Actions, you can explore over 180 climate actions in the basin or relevant to the basin. Climate science here, you can brush up on your clients' climate science basics. And then over in the data, you can um, explore future climate projection scenarios using 40 climate variables. So for example, if you want to look on uh, look at how many more warm summer days Castlegar will have in the 2050s, just click on summer days. That's the number of days above 25 degrees. Choose 2050s with a high emissions scenario, and then come down here and you can click on uh, say Castlegar and it's 97 summer days for the 2050s. That's 39 more days since the 1960s. There's all these non-climate layers over here. So there's something here for everyone. Check it out, play around, share it with your colleagues and friends. We've got the link in the chat and they'll also be in the resource document for this webinar. Thank you. And so now we'll go to question and answers. Um, oops, sorry, folks. And I'm going to start off with a couple of ones that came in for uh, Jesse and Casey. In, in terms of how the species composition has been moving around your site, have you seen that there are more southern species that are extending their range into your project area? Um, you know, I think it's, uh, I think bullfrogs are a good example of that. Um, something that we actually have a lot of data to back, back that up with is like, that's definitely a species that should, was never here and shouldn't be here, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, there might be a few other species that, um, that I don't really, we might, you know, come to mind like some insect species for instance um, but I think uh, the invasives are the ones that we're that we're thinking about and I think bullfrogs are the great example so yeah I think there's there's evidence of that and probably due to, to climate changes and definitely changes within the valley not being the, the native or the the historic conditions it used to be um, so that's my best example <laughs> okay and then in terms of um, you know you mentioned weeds as one of your your primary challenges right now you know, when you look around the rest of the landscape and just given your history there and your terms of what you think is normal, um, do you think that with the heat dome we had and the extremely hot temperatures last summer, do you think that there was any effect? Um, yeah, I can cover that too. I think it had a, a severe effect, especially because um, that heat dome, as I'm sure you guys experienced as well, um, it happened in June. Like it was, it wasn't even in the hottest part of the summer you think it would be. And often our best times to try to control some of these weeds coming up are like in May and June when there's still some moisture in the landscape um, and things aren't so quite, quite so hot and dry. Um, and so I think that heat dome is about the best example you could think of recently of us impacting not only like promoting weed growth and, and, and unfortunately making um, resulting in failures in what we've planted, um, but also affecting our direct management of doing those things just because we, we weren't able to like be as effective in our management during the most the typically the time of the year then we're really concentrated on that so um yes i think very much so and last summer was the best example of that unfortunately okay thanks okay one more for you all and then i'll switch over to sonia so um someone noted here that you uh presented the positive results of air, uh, temperature solar radiation moisture retention on the uh the cars and did your monitoring show that there was significant dis difference in how the cars were configured and if you could talk about how you your methods your approach for monitoring the different features yeah i can touch on that um so basically what we did to monitor is um basically had like a sensor array of, of temperature sensors that ran down the north basically started on the ridges of the cars and then ran down the north 
facing slopes of them down the trough and then back up the other side to basically capture all the different aspects of them. And we had different kind of sensor suites of 10 sensors around. So hopefully we were able to like capture um, the conditions between all the different design of the cars. And I should preface this, we concentrate on one set of cars for, for the initial analysis. And then we're currently monitoring all the cars simultaneously. But what from what we've learned, we've concentrated on three. So we had these sensors out there. In addition to that, I went out and manually took soil moisture um, readings a couple times a month throughout uh, the summer of 2020. And we also did the same thing on the flat control area and basically um, just did a, a, compare, a comparison to see if there was a statistically significant difference between the temperatures that we were seeing or at least the highs that we were seeing. Um, and yeah, it, it turned out that it wasn't, it's not super clear cut. Um, so like certain times of the year, the differences weren't as significant or weren't significant. Um, maybe when the sun's a little bit higher in the sky, for instance, um, and other times of the year, they were, they had a drastic difference. Um, but I think the general takeaway from it is that I think you can really simplify it down to if it creates shade and it creates the most shade and it's probably does the best job. So like the hummocks, for instance, while they look more natural, they just didn't have as much of a north facing slope to actually you know, block more sun. So I don't think there was effective and as creating as much cool air refugia. Um, and then the the other cars were very similar, I think, um, in their design. Like I think the linear and the curvilinear car, um, both were similarly effective. It's just that the linear car that we looked at was far more effective for how deep it was dug into the ground, like I mentioned earlier. So I think that the fact that it was a little bit lower in the ground and it was a little bit closer to the, the moisture that's in the soil existing, it seemed that seemed to have a really big effect on kind of um, having the, the results that we were hoping for. But yes, they did have a significant difference. And, um, and we're hoping to kind of uh, probably publish that and make it more um, usable document in the future and just haven't got around to doing that yet. That's something I'm hoping to share in the, in the future, hopefully with future with the current monitoring we're doing as well. So. Great. Thanks very much. I know there's a few questions for Jesse and Casey I've left in the Q&A and please contact them if you'd like to follow up. Um, I'd like now to ask Sonia a couple questions. So Sonia, can you speak more to how you are able to reintroduce and incorporate cultural practices into your burns, in particular, how you're complying with the BC Wildlife Service requirements and guidelines? Sure, well, the, the answer is that we're not yet. <laughs> um, so in order to, uh, because we're we're dealing with, a, with an ecosystem right now that's so heavily fuel loaded, we need we needed to first do those thinning treatments, um, but our burn is going to have to take place under some really really strict protocol that have been set by um, the BC Wildlife Wildfire Service. So that's why we have a burn boss and a burn plan to execute this. That's why we're going to have um, a bunch of you know equipment supports and really big guards. Like it's it's quite it's a lot more precarious at this time than it would have been when cultural burns took place um, before uh, fire suppression and before the before that practice was outlawed. So the long the long and short of it is in 2023 we're hoping to conduct this possibly higher intensity prescribed burn under a lot of with those controls in the hopes that we then have a much less fuel loaded ecosystem in which we can really truly practice our own stewardship. Um, so that would be community fire keepers. Um, yeah, but that only works um, if we reduce the fuel load and we can actually ensure that those are low intensity and safe burns. Um, so not really, <laughs> it's kind of, a, kind, of a, kind of a sideways answer, but uh, yeah, we haven't got there yet. Okay, well, we'll look forward to it when you do because it's new ground you're treading there, so. Appreciate your, your trying to get an answer. And I don't mean to put you on the spot with this question. So this may be something you follow up with, um, but someone's curious how you actually came up with the metrics that you came up with for measuring what you did and uh, how climate adaptation can be measured and that may get to effectiveness monitoring or other measures or metrics you have for what and how you did and how you measured. Right, um, so our effectiveness monitoring, 
uh, to be more specific about what that looks like. It's actually long-term permanent vegetation monitoring plots. So what we're looking for over time is a ecosystem shift to like greater diversity and abundance of, um, of native plant species, of indigenous plant species of interest, but also um, an increase in, you know, grasses, forbs, shrubs over time. Uh, it's the same, it's the same methods that are employed by some of our other partners by the, um, so Rocky Mountain Trench uh, Natural Resources Society and the Trench ER program have developed those protocols. So um, it's similar. I'm not sure that that's what Mark is going to speak to um, two weeks from now, but uh, they do the same kind of monitoring on their forest restoration projects as well. Uh, so that's how we're monitoring um, results, monitoring effectiveness. Uh, we haven't got into anything like carbon sequestration. Um, so the, it, that those, you know, those uh, effects are something we're not looking for the same way that we're looking for sort of like an ecosystem shift, I guess. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to leave it there. Again, there's questions. Uh, if you have them for Sonia, please contact her uh, directly. I know that there's uh, many people have had to leave, but I appreciate all of you who have stayed on. And I just want to, again, thank our presenters, um, uh, Sonia, Jesse, and Casey. Thank you so much. Excellent presentations. Obviously, so much to talk about. Um, we've run out of time, but you did a great job fielding the questions. I really appreciate your thoughtfulness on that. And on behalf of KCP and the Trust, and FWCP, I'd like to say thank you for joining us uh, during this webinar. As I said, we will have a, a, a follow-up email to you with a link to the recording. And we also have a post-webinar survey that if you're able to stay on, uh, Kendall will put that in the chat box as a link. We're always very interested in the feedback you give us. It helps shape our programs. For those of you um, who get our e-news, uh, we have a great For the Love of the Kootenays series coming up with uh, a little daily dose of projects that are happening throughout our region funded by the local conservation funds. And I also want to remind you, I hope to see you all next Wednesday uh, on the 16th for building climate resiliency into your aquatic restoration projects. So again, thanks everybody. Thanks our presenters, our funders. Um, it was a great morning of learning. I hope you all have a great day. Bye.